Dan, uh, just just a, a note with the drill sergeants, tube sponges. Well, many years ago, Ken Casters he he described a lot of fossil sponges from New York, and in one of his papers, he's got something like that. He's got a uh, internal mold of some pneumonia sponges. Like hydrocerus? Yeah, and on at least one of them, there's an impression of a brittle star. Wow. And I reckon it was right inside, just like the modern one you showed. And I, I think you must be correct about the trial of this, too. I, I think this was an outstanding presentation. Very fascinating. That's Doc. Very fascinating. What did people, especially Carl, do you think of my idea about the bit mice having something to do with the abundance of the animals? Does that sound totally goofy, or is it just something, you know? Well, I would say totally goofy. I think there are other places where there are abundant sponges with bang too. I do wonder. Uh, often the shirt as well. I know other shirts come from people in some cases from the back. Yeah, almost every bit might have been a shirt earlier. I guess these are solidified, you said. Uh, uh, the ones that have been solidified, they're in the Brabant. Mm. The ones here in. And the spicules are silica, but I think most of the framework of the specimen is actually calcite. There's calcite filling in between the sponge spicules. What do you I don't do, do a thin sec. I'll have a, unfortunately, being a, uh, a non-professional paleontologist, I don't always have access to uh, thin section technology or very basic stuff. Um, you have to bribe people with beers and stuff at UK to get that type of thing done. <laughs> what do you think of the two here? specimens we had? Well, this one looks like Rockford. It's heavily solidified. This would have been a monster if it had been complete. No shame. The rest of it was These are just two things we've Look at it very close. After the talk, come up and get the look at these and use hand lenses and look at some of the spicules and stuff. This other one is really fascinating because it appears to be more like the delicate type with the thin arms. Waste of time. Yeah. Be really careful. Don't pick it up and drop it on. <laughs> but it, another thing, I'm not sure how many different species there are. There's probably a lot of ecotypes. I think we can eliminate tuberculata as a species. But on the other hand, you could go through and study things from the same outcrop and name them different species just based on the shape. You know, this thing here with the massive arms is a lot different than the digitata from, and the two little ones. Their arms are even more delicate, so it's hard to tell how these things, if you wanted to split them up into different species or not, or lump them all together as equal types. Then I'd be happy if you if the solidified one put it back in the thing. Oh, okay. So it's not going to be agitated. Compared to some of the ones <laughs> in the UK, UK has a number of these, but Yale has the biggest bulk of them. And this one's actually crappy compared to some of the ones in the UK. I understand, I understand. I understand. <laughs> they vary from just, there's, I think if, according to Beecher's old monograph, their specimens with only four or five arms, but their son is with as many as 16 arms. It probably had more sponges, they, they reproduce asexually, they bud, do all sorts of things. And it probably isn't genetic related, it's probably ecologically related how the number of arms they have. There's one specimen in this old, I have an original of this, but I don't dare open it for fear it will fall apart. Um, there's one specimen here that's considered deformed. I should have made a slide of it because it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Here's one that was probably tossed around on the seafloor and damaged during its growth. And it has some of the arms on this side are perfectly normal, others on this side look like they're regenerated or, or stunted in some way. The bigger ones have more. Is it hmm. This is the largest one known, and it doesn't have as many arms as some of the others. <laughs> and of course, we have the spindly type that yeah. seem to have more arms. But again, that might be ecological. Do you think they sat on those? Yes. Things. That was one of the one of my concerns with ever finding them in situ. Is you know, it, it makes sense that it's like we we concluded they are with the big operculum at the top. But there's always the possibility that they were completely asked backwards and upside down like that with the arms open. But finding them in situ pretty much resolved that. Chances are they could tumble around, but that was probably the most stable place in the land, too. So if they turned upside down, they could probably still feed for them. Most of the sponges, they're not 
colleges have a base that they're attached by, you know, one central base, and then, you know, like you had the branching ones there. Yeah, I suspect they're either using the arms for that purpose. It might even tumble from time to time. So maybe they. But many of the layers these are found in, you have abundant spicules and bison, like the Pattersonian specimens were. Do you think they were uh, cement to the hard ground? I don't know. Soft stuff. I don't know. I don't think there's enough preservation. It might be if we could take a big slab out and saw it up and look at it under a microscope, might be the only way to figure it out. Some of those cross sections you should have shown, maybe you could tell. That's, it's hard stuff to work with, which is yeah. Next, next time you give this talk again, you have to include a picture of the prehistoric version of SpongeBob. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, I can say all sorts of weird comments. <laughs> <laughs> that one might come back to kind of like a boomerang. <laughs>